Uh, hello and welcome to this special episode of The Debated Podcast. Um, this is a special episode that it acts as if um, the politics of the world of Doctor Who were real and we will be discussing it in a uh, semi-realistic, semi-serious uh, manner. Um, but I just thought I would add this introduction just to say that, yeah, th- this is all a joke. Um, this is all um, fictitious. N- none of the opinions expressed in this uh, podcast are the real ones held by the participants. It's all a um, bit of a joke, really. So I hope you enjoy uh, the podcast and I hope you keep that in mind whilst listening. Sometimes you just feel you have to make such disclaimers. Anyway, on with the episode. This podcast is sponsored by Axonite. Axonite. If you want to look good as a naked gold person, then use Axonite. Mankind stands tall, proud and undefeated. In fact, I go so far as to say that what this country really needs right now is a doctor. I suppose you could say we were lucky. Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will, and I'm joined by my co-host, Conrad. Hello. And in this episode, we are delighted to be joined by George Fairhurst, the host of Red Rose Reporting, amongst many other things, to discuss some of the real-world implications that we have faced over the past decade with our changing political scene. In the past decade, we have seen some incredible political figures like Harriet Jones and Harold Saxon rise and fall. But what is it that caused these rises and fall? What ensured that politicians that seemed so significant for one brief period of time suddenly disappeared almost without trace? So um, to begin with, George, I'd like to ask, um, what are your memories of the early pre-Harriet Jones days? I mean, obviously, we were all relatively uh, young then. Do you have any uh, memory of the the incidents leading up to Harriet Jones's rise to power, in particular, the infamous uh, near decimation of Big Ben by that strange object in the sky, which we saw directly in the run-up to her rise to power? Well, I mean, you're asking me to remember 2005, though. And that's <laughs> to do. Um, I, I mean, I do have memories, of course, just before Harriet Jones came to Isaiah of that incident, which uh, demolished Big Ben. Um, it, it was a quaint time. I mean, um, weirdly enough, since about the 90s, things have been quiet, as my mum told me. Nothing mm-hmm. really happened in terms of you know strangeness. And then Harriet Jones burst into the scene after the in, most of the cabinet was exposed, of course, to be um, some sort of alien creatures, it, it just blew my mind. I was watching the news, I think, for about a week straight, trying to get the full picture. Um, and beyond that, though, not so many memories. No, no. I, I mean, c- comrade, I, I presume that you're in a in a in a similar position as as we all are to not having too many vivid memories of the the pre Harriet Jones era. But I mean, do you have any memories at all of the uh, incident that? led up to, as, as George touched upon there, her rise to power, the, the incident with the, the strange uh, spaceship thing that uh, fell into, seemed to crash into Big Ben. Yeah, I mean, I do vaguely remember Tony Blair, that, that Prime Minister who disappeared around mm-hmm. that time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it was always a mystery as to sort of what happened to him. Um, it was never publicly revealed, so that was always a bit of a mystery to me. I sort of vaguely remember his, his, him being in there before, before obviously um, you had that, that um, yeah, the Har- Harriet Jones taking power afterwards and you know, she was, she was, um, you know, became quite a unifying figure in that, mm. in those, those days after, in that, that confusing time when, when we, we didn't really know what was going on, you know, was it aliens, was it a hoax, what was going on there? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it did seem really a very, uh, a very tense time, but as you say, she seemed to be very much of a, a unifying uh, figure, didn't she? And Harriet Jones's uh, brief time in office is often referred to as a as a golden era, isn't it? And I and I think that uh, some of the things that she enacted during that early time as Prime Minister have have stood uh, the test of time for us going forward to today. But 
equally. Um, she obviously didn't have that longer period in office, did she, George? I mean, can you no. remember her her really um, quite spectacular fall at all from office? I mean, everything seemed fine, didn't it? Everything mm. seemed lovely and stable. And then all of a sudden, she was just gone. And then I, I remember that, I mean, I wasn't old enough to vote at the time, but suddenly mm. I just kind of was overcome with this desire for this man called Harold Saxon, who I had absolutely no memory of, or, or really any prior recollection to. But I just remember thinking, he'd be quite good as um, Prime Minister. Um, I even tried to go off and vote in that snap election in 2006, if you remember it. Um, Really very weird Christmas that year because um, Anne Whittacombe just came on the TV announcing he was there back him and suddenly before you know it he was Prime Minister I, mm. I mean it was such a swift transition you didn't even have time to react to it no, no, you didn't. And I mean, I, I, I think that strange uh, Christmas which seemed to precede uh, Harriet Jones's uh, fall from office when th th there seemed to be something affecting, um, what was it, people's um, blood? Was it making them act in a very strange way? Some really strange uh, thing going on with people standing on, on, on top of the uh, roof ledges. I mean, I, I, I don't know, Conrad, do you remember that at all? Yeah, it was very strange. You know, I mean, I have members of my family who, uh, who went up to a roof and then it was, it was a very worrying time, of course, mm. Christmas Day. And then, you know, everything was suddenly fine again. But that was kind of around the time soon after you got the health questions about Harriet Jones and how mm. she was, she was, you know, I mean, she seemed fine beforehand, but yeah, the, it was all, you know, she just seemed too tired to, to really carry on. And, it, you know, I didn't feel like, she, you know, a lot of people didn't seem to think she, you know, my parents and other people thought they, she wasn't, you know, able to carry on. And, mm. um, yeah, the, I mean, we had the defence secretary, um, Harold Saxon, who, um, when there was that, that mysterious star, you know, the following Christmas that was over, over London, he, he shot, he, he, he was involved in shooting that down and he seemed to be a great possibility for a replacement. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, we'll just take this moment for a bit of a, uh, an intercut with a, um, recording of an interview that I conducted a, a bit earlier on, which touches upon some of these issues, uh, that we discussed uh, we're, we're discussing right now. It's an interview that I did uh, not that long ago with Tom Harris, who was a, a Labour MP and also a minister under Harriet Jones. So we'll just have a listen to what he had. Um, so the uh, question uh, that I'd like to ask you, uh, Tom, is what was it like uh, serving under Harriet Jones as a minister in her government? It was quite a short-lived government, wasn't it? It was. It lasted less than a year. It was. It was dramatic. It was an unusual period in, in British politics um, because she she introduced new constitutional concepts. So, for example, um, she introduced this. Well, actually, it was her predecessor, Joseph Green, introduced this new concept that they have in America, where there is a a line of succession of the president. Mm -hmm. Something happens to the president, then it's the vice president, and then it's the Leader of the House, of Rep Speaker of the House of Representatives, etc. We don't have that, Bren. We we have the Queen who decides who becomes the Prime Minister if the first one drops dead. But Joseph Green invented this idea that since the, all the rest of the government had been wiped out, he was a junior minister, the last junior minister standing, so he became Prime Minister, which we all just thought was bizarre, sitting in the tea room thinking, who's Prime Minister? Mm. And then sh very shortly after that, um, Harriet puts her, herself forward and no, none of us was quite sure how she emerged as the leadership, the only leadership candidate in an uncontested race. Somebody said that some friend of hers who works with the government had suggested it, but we thought, mm. well, well, why are these people interfering in politics? But there we are, before we knew it, we had our third prime minister in, in a month. Mm. So um, was it something that um, you, you thought would be... Uh, uh, completely revolutionary for politics. I mean, it, it, it did seem so looking back that it was a complete and utter uh, change in, in, in the political system. And, and subsequently, after Harriet Jones became prime minister, there was quite a lot of um, shake up in, in, in the, the political system, wasn't there? It, there was, it was such a weird period now that when I look back on it, I have to ask myself, did all that really happen? Mm. But those of us who lived through it, you know, we, we've, we've all got our diaries, we've all got our memories of that time. And it was, it was a very strange 
It's a very strange time indeed. And Harry was lovely. You know, she was a very popular member of the Commons. She used to spend a lot of time in the tea room speaking to colleagues. But she was just that. She was just a colleague. She was a fairly um, unknown, anonymous backbencher. And then suddenly, after all that fuss in central London with explosions and spaceships and, and, and pigs in space suits, uh, suddenly she was, she was the Prime Minister. And of course, she didn't last long and things didn't go well for her hmm. after that. Um, of course, there was the Sycorax scandal. Mm, yes, of course. I, I, I don't know if you want me to say any more about that. It was all very, very fraught at the time. Yeah. Because she, she has essentially commissioned... Uh, intelligence, which she insisted proved that the Sycorax had weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we all had to be consulted on whether or not we should blow the out of the sky. Mm, yeah. And she wanted to, and the Commons actually, you know, having gone down that road once before in recent years, we said no. Mm. But she took it into her own hands anyway, made an executive decision and, uh, and, and, and blew, it, blew it up. Mm. But then shortly after that, you know, it, it became clear that she wasn't actually physically very well. Yeah. And she became under a lot of pressure to, to stand down. Mm. And then, of course, um, in the wake of uh, Harriet Jones uh, stepping down in a, in a relatively short uh, period of time, we saw the emergence of a, a, an almost completely new political party, didn't we, under uh, Harold Saxon? I mean, um, at that time as a, as a Labour MP, what, what was it like to see this sudden... Um, complete and utter major change in the political system with, with Saxon emerging as this um, in incredibly popular figure. Well, we all thought Saxon was a total psychopath. Mm. We thought he was a, you know, a, a nutter uh, who would destroy not only Britain, but the world if he got the chance. Uh, so, yeah, we, we loved him. Mm. We, th we thought he was great and we're very happy to swing in behind him and make him Prime Minister. Um, mm. And then, of course, just not that long after that, uh, after I'd left Parliament, of course, uh, they tried to do it all over again with Jeremy Corbyn, but that didn't work out. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, uh, Harold Saxon um, disappeared almost as um, he uh, appeared on the political scene, didn't he, after the assassination of uh, President Winter? I mean, what, what sort of like feelings did you have when uh, the Prime Minister had so suddenly uh, disappeared af after the President was assassinated. Well, I, I've got very strong opinions, uh, very strong principles on this. Uh, on the whole, I prefer British Prime Ministers uh, not to sell the planet to, to uh, alien butchering machines and, mm. and, and assassinate American presidents. On the whole, I'm against that. Not everyone agrees with me, you know. Mm. Um, but, I, yeah, I felt that those particular policies were ill-advised. Um, but I didn't say so. Because mm. frankly, you know, I uh, didn't want to to be slaughtered in my bed along with my family. Mm. So I, I said nothing, kept my head down and waited for it all to pass, which it did eventually, mm. very, very bizarrely. Yeah. There's some fascinating insights there um, from Tom Harris. And I think he did touch upon something that both of you have, have really sort of commented upon right now, which is Harold Saxon's sudden rise to prominence. I mean, what do we think it was that suddenly made this seemingly unremarkable uh, junior minister who then became, as Conrad said, defence secretary, suddenly so popular and, you know, everybody from all political parties were, were, were suddenly following him? I mean, George, what, what do you think it was that suddenly gave Harold Saxon this massive appeal to people? I mean, if you remember 2007, the government was just in paralysis. There was uh, this real sense of decline. And and really, Harold Saxon at the time kind of embodied this almost unity in politics because when was the last time that Anne Whittacombe and the Banwick fly agreed on anything? Oh, never. Yeah. And they both liked Harold Saxon. And what was it? He had something like a 64% lead in the Telegraph. I mean, not the Telegraph, but still, it was... Phenomenal, this lightning. I think it was really that that led to it. And, you know, Comrade touched on, on it before, you know, his handling of the whole star crisis. I think that really elevated him in towards the public conscience. It was a just, uh, it was a proper flash in the pan moment that he used to his full advantage. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think this is something as, as, as well that you, you sort of like, um, as George just said, that you touched upon, Conrad, was the incident um, with the, the, the giant star. I mean, that was a very strange thing to happen in London, wasn't it? Um, do you think that 
you know, had we not seen Harold Saxon interfere with and uh, destroy that strange Christmas star thing, that we would have had the same kind of uh, respect and admiration that we seem to have for Harold Saxon for quite a while. Well, I think it helped, but I mean, it wasn't just that. I mean, he had a, a sort of a magnetism. I mean, mm. I mean, I guess like a, a you know, a sort of a skinny white guy in a, in a suit is a, is a very sort of typical politician these days. But there was, you know, there's, 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 there, was, there was something, you know, almost ineffable that, you know, you mm. can't really do it. There was just this idea of someone being prime ministerial, you know, and you saw it with, you know, the, you know, the disappeared Tony Blair before, but, mm. you know, Harold Saxon was in that mould of the, you know, even more so to another level, even the, even the, than Blair, because Blair had his critics. There wasn't really any critics of Harold Saxon. You know, there was some journalists. I don't know what what happened to them. Mm. Um, who you know who 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 had a few you know ravings about him, but they, they, you know they they seemed to drop off and, and and disappear off, and we didn't see much about them for very long. Mm. And uh, yeah, and then he was, took power. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And we're just going to listen to some uh, archive uh, audio clips that I've managed to, to dig out of people describing why they supported Harold Saxon and what it was about him that, that really made them uh, want to vote for him and support him. I mean, a lot of people um, were really sold on the, on the back of the, the Anne Widdicombe uh, recommendation because she's so she's she's got so much caliber and Whitaker. um but i think i think when he shot down a massive um weird crystal thing in the sky over london kind of cemented him in the, the public consciousness as um as the kind of no-nonsense politician you, you kind of want around westminster uh, he blew the Rachnos out the sky. Did you see what he did to the Rachnos? Honestly, that was an amazing Christmas laugh. <laughs> oh, wow. What a lad. I don't do ifs, buts and maybes. I do absolutes. And he is absolutely fantastic. He's a sound lad. I thought when he said what this country needs now is a doctor, that he were, he were really correct. Because, I mean, if you look at the state of the NHS now and, and back when he was campaigning to be Prime Minister, I mean, you know, the situation with doctors is, wasn't great then and it isn't great now. So I think he really hit the, you know, the nail on the head by saying what this country needs right now is a doctor. Why did I vote for Harold Saxon? Well, it's perfectly simple, really. First of all, there was his style, his joie de vivre, his connection with the ordinary man. And then, of course, there was his promise to get Brexit done. I couldn't resist that. The tackle of fame. I mean, who remembers the tackle of fame? You know, I had a guy, big guy, came up to me the other day, tears in his eyes. He said, sir, what the tackle of fame did for this planet, nobody else has ever done. Big admirer, big admirer, big guy. He loved what the tackle of fame did, and we're going to bring the tackle of fame back. We are going to bring the tackle of fame back. And if we can get Harold Saxon back, Harold Saxon, big guy, strong guy, to lead the tackle of fame again like he did once before, I would 100%, 110%, that means I could backtrack 10%, still be fully behind it. I think if we could do that, you know, whole world, whole world would be such a better place, be such a better place. And I mean, those were some absolutely fascinating um, clips there of people saying why they wanted to support Harold Saxon. But I think now we need to turn again to the, the sudden downfall of Harold Saxon, because like Harriet Jones, an incredibly popular figure who just suddenly uh, completely and utterly disappeared, just, just, just disappeared off the scene after the um, death live on television of President Winters. Um, George, I mean, what do you remember about Harold Saxon's sudden disappearance? Well, I thought it was a long time coming. I mean, you know, his wife seemed nice enough, but mm. immediately when he got to power and he kind of called the entire cabinet and they're all gone, I mean, I thought it was very much in the Macmillan mould, but mm. still it was a bit of a rush for that. But... I think for me, you know, the, the, the whole f the thing where I, I remember my parents went out and started chanting doctor over and over again. And I, I kind of thought that was quite the weird coincidence. Again, I was young, so you, you must excuse the lack of memory I've got on this. But I thought that the, the death of him live on TV, I mean, that was just, 
Yeah, that was certainly something, wasn't it? Um, I, I think his down, downfall was um, at the same time as being quite, you know, unpredictable and like you could have never seen it coming because somebody with such a vice like grip on politics leaving the scene so suddenly didn't expect that. But at the same time, it, you, you didn't think that his uh, regime could carry on forever, could you? No, no, absolutely. I mean, Conrad, do you have any memories at all of uh, Harold Saxon's sudden disappearance and, and, and the death of President Winters live on television, which was so shocking for so many people? Yes, it was. I mean, um, he, was, he was sort of talking about sort of this alien, you know, first contact. Mm. You know, I mean, we've seen strange things before. People said they were aliens, but... You know, he was saying this was going to be humanity talking with an alien race, and um, yeah, then what we what we all saw, um, and then yeah, there was a bit of a bit of a blur around that time in terms of what went on, and then he was just gone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I, I remember there were some pictures a few years later of some guy in a hoodie who looked a bit like him, mm, yeah. but I'm, but I mean, I'm sure that was just some you know just a, just a coincidence, a lookalike. I'm not sure that would that would have been actually him. Why, why would he be doing that? You know, a few years later, just running around, you know, with you know in a in a quarry. Why would that be going on? Yeah, I know that that was a very that was a very strange thing, wasn't it? And there were quite a lot of conspiracy theories related to him and related to what happened to him. I mean, um, George, do you remember any sort of like conspiracy theories related to him? I mean, the hoodie one, they, those really went viral about 2009, 2010, didn't they? Uh, you see, the only thing I remember was that he'd actually faked his death because of the fact that um, he hadn't claimed all the proper expenses on the Valiant aircraft carrier. Mm, yeah. And so when the expenses scandal came out, he had simply quit the scene before he knew he'd be brought down anyway, which is then why he did take his death and go off into the blue when his political party collapsed into nothing. Really, if you look at Australian politics, that's actually done quite often over there. So, you mm. know, yeah, yeah, that's all I've really got. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I think we've touched upon these, you know, re- really quite clearly as to, that there does seem to be this strange... Um, thing that has happened recently with, with British politicians over the past 10 years, in particular prime ministers of them suddenly appearing and then disappearing. And, and, and one that, whose fall was particularly vivid uh, was that of um, Brian Green, who of course was prime minister uh, during the uh, 456 incident. I mean, Conrad, what do you remember of um, Brian Green? Because there was that leaked audio, the, the audio that we use in our uh, debated intros of, of, of him seeming to, to parlay with some alien group to do with 10% of Britain's children. I mean, do you remember anything about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, 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 I mean, I was, I was a child at the time, so I was, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know as, as we all were. So we, we were speaking in unison and, you know, we didn't remember what was going on really. And people yeah. were very sort of concerned about that. I mean, I wasn't one of the, the children chosen. And I mean, thankfully, you know, who knows what would have happened because, mm. Because you know they, they you know they, they were talking about this this disease and taking people off for vaccines, but um, it's a it's a very interesting thing really what went on, and I don't know. Um, yeah, there's, it was still shrouded in mystery, but yeah, Brian Green disappeared not long after that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there was something involving a. There seems to be a lot of talk about an, a, a group called Torchwood or, or, or something like that, Wood Torch. I mean, George, have you, have you ever, ever heard of a group like that involved with, with Brian Green or involved with any sort of like political incidents in, in the UK? Oh, Torchwood's just a myth made up by Brian Green supporters because it'd be very convenient if he had some sort of backstage thing which handled the... Um, incident involving 10% of this nation's children, because really Brian Green was of the Ted Heath mould. Um, he gambled the nation's safety on his own political vanity, and when it didn't come up, he had his supporters spread these rumours of Torchwood mopping up the mess. And uh, I, Really, I think his sudden vanishment was the fact he knew the game was up, so I, I personally think that Torchwood simply doesn't exist and was made up by Green's uh, political allies. Yeah, I mean, that is a theory that has been um, propagated for a very long time, hasn't it? That Torchwood was just a, uh, a, a fall guy for Green and that it was just a means of him getting out of the, the mess that he had um, gone involved with. And more recently, we have seen um, a, a kind of like a, uh, perhaps not the same sort of like prominence of um, prime ministers in number 10 as, as, as Harriet Jones 
or um, Harold Saxon. There seems to have been quite a few uh, changes over uh, as, as to who was uh, prime minister. But more recently, we had a, a politician who seemed to, to cut through a, a bit more, particularly in her um, handling of defence, and that was Joe Patterson. I mean, Conrad, what, what did you think of, of, of Joe Patterson, who relatively recently met a, a very um, unfortunate end? Well, you know, I think she she had the nation's interest at heart. I mean, all she wanted, all she wanted to do was keep people safe. And you know, mm. there's so much, you know, trouble, riots, all sorts of things going on. And you know, all she wanted to do was, you know, make sure that people, you know, her, you know, her country was kept safe. And that's why she did a deal with that great um, Mr. Robertson, that now now to be hopefully President Robertson, mm. who, um, yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, he's a great businessman, and he's um, had a great career. You know, he tells it like it is you know he he stands up puts america first and i think you know you know them together that that would have been a great partnership sadly she met a, a sticky end yeah she did didn't she involving those um defense droids i, th- I think that's what she she called them or, or, or something uh similar to that they, they started this very strange chant or or, or something like that after um, m- malfunctioning and, and unfortunately uh killing uh prime minister uh uh, Patterson. I mean, do do you remember uh, what happened to to Joe Patterson, uh, George? Do, do, do you? I mean, it's only relatively recently, but the involvement with those um, safety device things very oddly designed. Well, I, I've been maintaining my stringent views on the defence drones and what happened to Patterson mm. since day one. Quite simply put. The defence drones asked Patterson to surrender and she failed to comply. Frankly, she dealt with the repercussions of her own laws. I mean, what's not to understand about this? Mm. And then the ongoing then drama that ensued with almost London being ransacked by them. Well, you know what? That's just the fact that we live in such a lawless country now that political heavyweights like um, Harold Saxon are gone. I, I mean, really, Patterson... Uh, is the bottom of why this country needs strong leadership again. And, you know, frankly, she got the fate she deserved for the fact that um, she refused to comply with those defence drones, which I'm currently lobbying Parliament to bring back, really, because I've, I've had just about enough of this shambles of a country. Mm, yeah, I think certainly there will be a lot of um, listeners who will agree with you, George, that we need more of those defence drones and maybe in some um, different colours or some different designs. I, I think it'd be quite interesting to see them in gold. I think gold would be quite a nice colour for the um, defence drones. Well, we're coming towards uh, the end of the podcast. I think that we've hopefully explained to, to, to people of our own age and perhaps a bit younger as to the, the strange political um, setup that we find in uh, the UK at the moment. In the next episode, we'll be interviewing a uh, former Cambridge scientific advisor called uh, Liz Shaw, who will be spilling the beans on some of her work during the 1970s, aiding a group uh, allied with the United Nations called UNIT or, or UIT. It, it, it's a bit vague at the moment, but we'll find out more when we speak to, to Liz Shaw in the next episode. Um, before we end, um, George, as you are uh, our guest, I have one uh, final question for you um what do you think has been the defining political moment of the of of the past few years the moment that you think really changed everything and and set us on the the strange uh course that we have found ourselves in mentioned a few times already i think it was the moment that Anne Widdicombe decided to back uh, harold saxon that was it really there was no turning back from then um, as well as the fact that there was also that mass wipeout of all the political party leaders in 2008. I mean, mm. you know, I know that's not quite as important as uh, the reforms on universal credit, but I like to think that was a real turning point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Conrad, do, do you have any other uh, uh, thoughts on what you think the, the, the main turning point was, or, or, or do you agree with George? Yeah, I think I think it was, um, it was yeah, Harriet Jones... Um, when she when she left office, and they they all thought she was tired. But you know, I think um, you know that generally she put she put she put that she was she did the right thing in defending the country. And I think you know I think if she'd have stayed on, who knows? Maybe maybe we would have had a more stable country for years to come. Absolutely. Well, I think we can all agree with that. Well, thank you for listening uh, to this latest episode of the podcast. As I said, make sure to check back next week for our interview with Liz Shaw. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. It's a very different episode of the podcast. I hope that you enjoyed it. It's been a bit of an experiment uh, for us, so I hope 
it was something that you thought was worthwhile listening to. Um, if you did, then please let us know. If you didn't, I'd you know, rather if you kept it to yourself. Uh, no, seriously, um, thank you for listening. Uh, and I hope you enjoy listening to the next episode. The next episode, obviously, won't actually be uh, with Liz Shaw, um, but it will be with some very interesting, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks for listening. Please do share as widely as possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.